I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Today's episode will focus on the Greek god Hermes. In Greek mythology, Hermes is shown as a clever god. He is a trickster and also a thief, but he also serves as a humble messenger boy, bringing the will of the gods to human beings. He also steps in on several occasions to aid Greek heroes in their quests. In Greek religion, Hermes had a special association with travelers, thieves, and merchants. He is an important god for anyone who moves from place to place, engages in public speaking, or has to persuade someone to their line of thinking. Like most of the other Olympians, the name Hermes appears in surviving texts of the Mycenaean Greeks. The meaning of his name, though, is a bit of a mystery. It is likely linked to the word herma in some way. These were the name for pillars of stone that were used as boundary markers between plots of land across ancient Greece. However, I've been told by a linguistics professor that the name Hermes instead means penis. This may in fact also refer back to the same thing, though. Some of the surviving boundary stones even have images of male genitalia carved onto them. In archaic period Greek art, Hermes is shown as a bearded man, but in later periods, he is shown younger, more like a teenager, and without the beard. Regardless, though, Hermes typically wears winged sandals, a flat, wide-brimmed hat, and holds a staff. And this is the classic representation of Hermes that you've probably seen today. With his hat and winged sandals, Hermes is easy to find in various pieces of art from ancient Greece and Rome. Probably the best myth centered on Hermes is the story of his birth and his theft of Apollo's cattle. It clearly explains a few things about Hermes, why he is the god of shepherds, and why he is the god of thieves. It also shows Hermes at his most crafty. In fact, he does everything in the myth immediately after his birth, while he is still a cute little baby only a few days old. The main sources of this story are the Homeric hymns to Hermes and Apollodorus' library. The story in Apollodorus' library is basically a summarized version of the longer Homeric hymn to Hermes. The Homeric hymn to Hermes is actually the longest Homeric hymn that we have today. The stories are very close otherwise. This myth is also referenced by others throughout the time of ancient Greece, by early authors like Hesiod, and later period ones as well. All of them agree that Hermes was the son of Zeus, of course he is, almost everybody is, and Maya. Maya is one of the younger generation of titans that has popped up occasionally. Specifically, she was third generation, being one of the daughters of Atlas. Their affair took place after Zeus's marriage to Hera. Apparently, Maya did not have a problem with Zeus punishing her father Atlas by having him hold up the sky. The Homeric hymn to Hermes tells how the two lovers met in the middle of the night, unseen by any gods and mortal humans. Maya was a very shy goddess who lived apart from gods and men in a cave. Maya became pregnant with Hermes and gave birth to him in the same cave. Hermes is a baby wonder, though, and he's about to get started on his very first day of living. Apollodorus' library explains that once he was born, Maya wrapped the baby Hermes in blankets and put him in a cradle, but he soon escaped and began his adventures. The Homeric hymn says that outside the cave, Hermes found a tortoise and killed it. He took the shell and cleaned out all of the guts and flesh, leaving a hollow tortoise shell, and we'll come back to what he did with that shell in a moment. After leaving the cave, Hermes went to the mountains of Pyria in northern Greece. Here in the mountain meadows grazed the herds of the god Apollo. Hermes cut off 50 of these cattle from the rest of the herd and drove the cattle away. But Hermes did one other thing. He reversed all the cow's hoof prints to make them hard to track and also walked backwards himself. In this way, it would be hard to find the direction that they had gone. As he was taking the cattle away, Hermes invented sandals and bumped into an old man who watched a small baby and the cattle go by in such a strange backwards way. Hermes told him to forget what he had seen and in reward, his fields would bear fruit and provide lots of wine for the old man. Once he had got far enough away, Hermes corralled all the cattle together and fed them. Next, he took two sticks from the laurel plant, trimmed them, and rubbed them together in order to make smoke first and then fire. In this way, Hermes had made another invention, fire sticks. Once the fire had got big and hot, Hermes took two of the cattle and sacrificed them. He cut up their meat, put them on spits, and roasted them over a fire. When that was done, he took all the meat and divided it into portions for each of the Olympian gods. Hermes also did something else. From the sacrificed cattle, Hermes took two strings of flesh, or gut, and tied them to the hollow tortoise shell from before. In doing so, Hermes had made his third invention after sandals and fire sticks. He invented the lyre, a musical instrument resembling a small harp. And at the same time, Hermes made a fourth invention, musical pipes. The Homeric hymn actually mentions the invention of the harp first, to introduce the theft of the cattle. But chronologically, it occurs after the theft. After that, Hermes did what any good thief would do. He destroyed all the evidence. 
he threw his sandals into the river, put out the fire, covered the ashes with sand, all under the cover of darkness. Then, at dawn, he went back to the cave of his mother. He passed through the keyhole like a mist and snuck back into his cradle, keeping the lyre close to him. But sure enough, Hermes could not fool his mother. She saw him come back to the cave, and she knew what he was up to and warns him that Apollo would soon come to find him. But Hermes has an answer for her. He says that his actions are basically all part of a plan, to go and live in fellowship with the other deathless gods on Olympus, to be granted honors by his father Zeus, and to become the Prince of Thieves. Hermes also threatens that he may even go to Apollo's house at Pytho, in other words, to the temple of Apollo at Delphi, and rob it of Apollo's tripods, cauldrons, gold, iron, and clothes. Meanwhile, Apollo has realized his cattle are missing, and like a detective, he set out to find them. Sure enough, he finds the old man that watched Hermes pass by with the cattle and asks him if he's seen anything out of the ordinary. The old man, perhaps forgetting his conversation with Hermes, tells Apollo about how just the other day he saw a baby herd cattle backwards towards a distant meadow. So Apollo goes and finds the hoof prints, realizes they are backwards and point towards the meadow, and so goes in the other direction, eventually arriving at Maya's cave. When he sees an angry Apollo approaching, Hermes cuddles up with his blankets and pretends to be asleep. But Apollo is not fooled, and he tells the baby Hermes to tell him about his cattle, or Apollo will take Hermes and throw him into Tartarus, the dungeon realm of the universe. But Hermes pretends to be innocent. Instead, he questions why Apollo has come to him with such harsh words. He says that he cannot give news of the cows, he's never heard of the cows, he's never seen the cows. In fact, he doesn't even know what cows are and that he, as a baby, only cares for a few things, for sleep, for the milk of his mother's breast, and wrappings around his shoulders, and having warm baths. He says that he doesn't want anybody to hear about the dispute with Apollo, for it will be a great marvel indeed among the deathless gods that a child newly born should pass into the house with cattle of the field. Hermes also points to the physical evidence of his own feet, pointing out that he was only born yesterday, and his feet are soft, whether the ground is rough, and would have dirtied his feet. But Apollo does not believe Hermes and says that he will be forever known as the Prince of Thieves. And with that, Hermes has gained the title he so badly wanted. Now Hermes then puts the next phase of his plan into action, to join the gods on Olympus, and says they should take their argument to Zeus. So sure enough, the two of them go to Olympus and stand at the knees of Zeus. They take turns telling Zeus their side of the story. Zeus sees through Hermes' lies immediately, but is amused and says that they should come to an agreement and search for the cows together. So Apollo and Hermes do just that, and eventually come to a field where Hermes hid the cows. At that point, Hermes plays the lyre and sings of the god's creation, and Apollo, who enjoys the music, laughs for joy. Apollo says, Slayer of oxen, trickster, busy one, comrade of the feast, this song of yours is worth fifty cows. And then he then asks, where did Hermes get the lyre from? Hermes says he made it, and offers the lyre to Apollo as a gift, and sweetens the deal with the pipes too. Hermes then asks for honors from Apollo in return. Apollo gives Hermes the fifty cows. Apollo then teaches Hermes some of the knowledge of omens and prophecy, and gives him a staff to carry. Finally, he asks Hermes never to steal from him again, and says that they will be eternal friends. At the end, Zeus grants Hermes the honors he craved so much. He makes him lord of birds, lions, boars, dogs, and sheep, and appoints Hermes to be the god's messenger to Hades in the underworld. And with that, Hermes' plan is complete. He is honored among gods and humans, and joins the other gods on Mount Olympus. Not bad for only being born yesterday. So, with this myth, we get a really detailed narrative that shows the birth of Hermes, how he came to join the rest of the Olympians, and how he gained his responsibilities. There is also something very interesting here going on with Apollo. In the Apollo episode before, I went through the Homeric hymn to Apollo that talks about the myth of his birth on Delos. You may remember that at the end of that myth, an infant Apollo declares what his own responsibilities are going to be, that the lyre and the bow will be important to him, and that he will provide prophecies and advice to humans, essentially setting himself up as a god of music, archery, and foretelling the future. Now, maybe he is just providing a prophecy for himself in this case, but in the myth I just shared, there is a different scenario for Apollo being the god of music. Instead of declaring it for himself, he gets the responsibility from Hermes. Hermes gives him the lyre and pipes that he himself invented. What's more is that both of these stories came from two different Homeric hymns, which date to the Archaic period, 
probably around 600 BC, and this provides two slightly different but still contemporary traditions of myth. Except for this Homeric hymn, Hermes is not really the star of a lot of myths that we have today from Greek mythology, which I think is a bit of a disappointment. Since Hermes is a trickster, I've always been surprised why there aren't more myths where he actively shows his cleverness off. Instead, in other myths, he is very much a secondary character. Hermes spends most of his time as a helper, getting others out of jams, or generally carrying out the will of Zeus. The Hellenistic poet Callimachus, who I've talked about already in a few other episodes, shares a cute story about Hermes's tricks on Olympus. Tethys was the mother of the 3,000 Oceanids, sea nymphs that have featured in several myths so far, usually as the wives and lovers of gods. The story goes that when the young Oceanids misbehaved, Tethys would call the Cyclops Argies, or Stereopes, to come and scare the children. But instead, Hermes would arrive, with burnt ashes blackening his face and disguised as a Cyclops. He would scare the misbehaving children until they ran back to the lap of Tethys. On Earth, like Athena, Hermes is often a patron of heroes. One such is Odysseus. When the hero Odysseus travels home after the Trojan War, he ends up on an island that is home to a witch named Circe. No, not Game of Thrones Circe. This Circe has an interesting habit of turning all the men that come to her island into animals. Before she meets Odysseus, though, Hermes comes and gives the hero a magic plant to eat, and gives him instructions on how to get the better of Circe. And it paid off. Odysseus and Circe even ended up becoming lovers for a period of time. Like Hermes, Odysseus' strength is that he is clever and crafty. As it turns out, Odysseus may have inherited some of that from the god himself. Odysseus' grandfather, Autolycus, was a son of Hermes, and Hermes taught him to be a great thief and trickster. Like Hermes, he was also a cattle thief, and stole the cattle belonging to a king. And like Hermes, he was also caught red-handed. On Olympus, Hermes is the herald of Zeus, the messenger of the Olympians. He is not only Zeus's messenger boy, though. He's also a delivery boy. Hermes delivers orphaned baby heroes to their adopted parents. He organizes contests, and Hermes is also the psychopomp, a fancy Greek word which means he guides the dead to the underworld. Hermes also acts as Zeus's fixer, trying to sort things out when issues arise. As I talked about in the Hera episode, Zeus once had an affair with a girl named Io, and turned her into a cow to hide her from his wife. But Hera saw through this, and managed to force Zeus to give her the cow as a present, taking Io away and getting her minion, Argus, to guard her. Argus was the giant with a hundred eyes spread over his entire body, so he could see in all directions. But Zeus sent Hermes to rescue Io, and he lulled the giant to sleep with music before smashing him over the head. As the god of merchants and travel, hospitality was very important to Hermes. In ancient Greece, there were specific duties for both guests and hosts. In Greek myths, the gods often traveled the world in disguises, check on the humans, and generally see how the world is doing. Sometimes they are pleasantly surprised with how mortals show hospitality, and sometimes they are forced to punish them. Since he is the god of travel, Hermes often dulls out the rewards and punishments related to hospitality. The story of Philemon and Bacchus is one example, and it was recorded in the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses. Zeus and Hermes traveled in disguises to Lydia, a kingdom in what is now western Turkey. Only one home welcomed them, though, the one belonging to an old couple named Philemon and Bacchus, and they were very poor. They lit a fire to keep the gods warm, cooked a cabbage, and fed them pork. They warmed water so the gods could bathe their feet, and brought out a mattress so they could rest. The couple, even with not much to give, gave them wine, cheese, and eggs, nuts, and figs. The gods continued to drink, and Philemon and Bacchus realized that the wine bowl had not emptied. It was then that they realized that they were not hosting normal men, but were hosting gods. Impressed with their hospitality, even though they were poor and did not have much to give, Zeus asked them what it is they desired. Philemon and Bacchus asked to be priests and guard Zeus and Hermes' shrine, and so they became priests. They looked after a shrine that Zeus and Hermes established, and finally, when they were at the end of their lives, the gods turned them into trees. A nice story, but in another later source, we get the opposite situation. What happens when hospitality is broken? In this case, there are two strong mortal giants, Agrios and Oreos the two children of a Thracian princess. These are two unpleasant brothers, and they do not honor the gods, scorn other men, and when strangers come to their home, they grab them and eat them. Eventually, 
Zeus finds out about this and sends Hermes to punish them. Hermes plans to have the brothers' hands and feet cut off, but it turns out that the brothers are actually descendants of the war god Ares. Ares saves them from being mutilated by suggesting to Hermes that he instead turn them into birds. So Hermes turns their mother and Oreos into owls, birds that are bad luck in ancient Greece. The brother Archeos was turned into a vulture, ugly scavengers that the Greeks did not like either. Just like in many other myths, gods are more than willing to turn mortals into new shapes as a punishment for crimes against the natural order. So, how did the mythology and cult of Hermes change over time? In a similar way to Hermes not having many myths to himself, in Mycenaean Greece, Hermes was also worshipped along other goddesses in the cities of Pelos, Thebes, and Knossos, and this was also the case in later periods too. He tended to share his space with other deities. Outside of these temples, though, Hermes' cult was popular in the countryside, which makes sense as he was the god of shepherds and boundaries. With his connection to boundaries, Hermes' responsibilities as messenger of the gods and guide of the dead come into play. Hermes' sandals are especially important symbols for him being a messenger. The Homeric hymn mentions Hermes inventing sandals, so he doesn't leave footprints, and Homer's Odyssey mentions Hermes' sandals as well. But both these archaic period sources do not specifically say they are winged, as is the case in most of Greek art. But a poem called The Shield of Heracles, which is believed to be written by Hesiod somewhere between 600 and 550 BC, does say that the sandals were winged. Remember that Hesiod was around the same time as the Homeric hymns, so the idea that Hermes had winged sandals is actually a pretty old idea. In the late archaic period and throughout classical Greece, Hermes's cult was very popular in and around the city of Athens. In the time of Athens' trade empire, around 450 BC, Hermes was a symbol for the city's navy and its expanding trade power, probably due to his importance for travelers, sailors, and merchants. The prosperity of Athens was linked to the favor of Hermes. Now, way back in the very first episode, I gave a breakdown of the history of ancient Greece. I talked about how what we consider classical Greece ended with the conquests of Alexander the Great. At that time, Alexander's father Philip united the Greek city-states, and Alexander finished the job and then took his armies into Asia and took over the Persian Empire. With that, the Greek world became much, much bigger, and for a couple hundred years afterwards, various Greek-led kingdoms would hold power in Egypt, throughout the Middle East, and even as far as what is now Afghanistan. That was the world of the Hellenistic period. Naturally, this bigger world brought in a lot of culture change, especially for the local religions. When different groups of ancient people came in contact with each other, it was very common for them to look at the gods the other people worshipped and compare them to their own. In fact, they would often think that the other group worshipped the same gods as them, but just with different names. The Greeks in particular were very keen to do this, and in the process they often shared or borrowed myths with other civilizations. In the Hellenistic period, this tendency was put into overdrive once Greek influence spread across much of the Middle East. In one example, the Greeks went into Egypt and looked at Thoth, the ancient Egyptian god of knowledge, and believed that he was the same as their god Hermes. The result was the growth of a combined Hermes-Thoth cult dedicated to a god named Hermes Trismegistus. His name means Hermes the three times great. Hermes Trismegistus was very much tied to knowledge, especially secret knowledge that was thought to explain how the world worked. Basically magic, really. This cult continued throughout the Hellenistic period. It changed over time, but survived into the medieval times, because people stopped thinking of Hermes Trismegistus as the god Hermes, and instead began to think of him as a human prophet who lived long ago. Early Christian writers even claimed that this prophet had predicted the rise of Christianity. But the knowledge that was believed to come from Hermes Trismegistus went even further than that as the centuries passed. Medieval people dabbling in chemistry tried to use what were supposedly the writings of Hermes Trismegistus in their attempts to make the Philosopher's Stone and convert lead into gold. So by the time of the Renaissance in Europe, Hermes Trismegistus had become a kind of wizard who was thought of as the legendary founder of alchemy. And all of this was happening long after the ancient Greek religion with its multiple human-like gods had been replaced by Christianity throughout much of Europe. In this way, though, Hermes survived for a long period after the other Greek gods 
were viewed as little more than characters in children's fairy tales. I bring up Hermes Trismegistus because I feel it gives a good example of how ancient myth can be repackaged, changed, and recycled into a new culture, while at the same time losing that association with mythology. But in other examples, Hermes is also still around today. People actually still widely use one of the symbols of Hermes, his staff, the Caduceus. At the end of the Homeric hymn to Hermes, the story of Hermes' theft of Apollo's cattle, the Caduceus is the staff that Apollo gave Hermes in exchange for the lyre. Hermes is often shown with this staff in Greek art. It is a simple rod that has two snakes twisting around it with their heads meeting at the top. You probably would recognize it if you saw it. The Caduceus often appears on medical buildings, equipment, logos, and ambulances today, especially in North America, but in particular the United States. It is very much a symbol of medicine today. But why is the staff of Hermes, the Greek god of trade, theft, and travel, used as the modern symbol of medicine? Well, it turns out that it's almost completely by accident. In the late 1800s, U.S. Army hospitals began putting the Caduceus on their badges, and in 1904, the U.S. Army formally adopted the symbol. The reason why is not really well known, but it may have been at the insistence of a particular Army colonel. Nevertheless, with its association with the U.S. Army Medical Corps, use of the caduceus as a symbol of medicine spread throughout civil society. But there is in fact another staff from Greek mythology that is more properly associated with medicine. The rod belonging to Asclepius, the god of medicine, the son of Apollo, is a staff with a single snake twisting around it. It's possible that the original modern use of the caduceus was simply due to an error in recognizing the right staff. Regardless, today, medicine-related groups and organizations also often use the rod of Asclepius' symbol instead. And that brings us to the end of the episode for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please get the word out and tell your friends. And while you're at it, please head over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and give the pod a five-star review.